let's take a look at how the exact algorithm looks like. I have a recursive function where what I'm looking for first is if I have reached the maximum depth that I would like to render. This means that if I say that I would like to render five bounces, then this is going to be five. Did I did I reach this number of bounces? Yes, okay, then just stop and return the back back probably because this way is not gonna continue. Then what I'm looking for is the nearest intersection. You remember from the previous lecture that this means parametric equations, which I solved for P. So what I'm interested in is that I am intersecting a lot of objects and I'm only interested in the very first intersection. And if I didn't hit anything, then I will return a black color because there's no energy going uh, in this through this way. Now, if I have the intersection of the object, I will be interested in the emission and the material of this object. Emission means that if this is a light source, then it's going to have emission. And the material can be an arbitrary VRDF, diffuse, glossy, or some complicated multi-layer material. This I'm going to store on that. <coughs> What's up next? Well, I would like to construct a new ray because I will trace the next ray. So I can I instantiate a new ray. This will start wherever I hit this object. So if I hit the table, I will create a new ray that starts from the table. And I will set the outgoing direction according to some sampling scheme that I have. Let's say that what they have here, if it says that random unit vector in the hemisphere of where the object was hit, and this sounds like a diffuse case to me. So I generate a random unit vector on this hemisphere, and this is going to be the outgoing direction. Now let's add together the elements of the random equation. I have the cosine theta, which is the light attenuation. I have the BRDF term, and in the BRDF term, it seems that here they have also included this cosine theta part, which is the light attenuation. This is the albedo of the material. How much light is absorbed and how much is reflected. And then what I would like to do is I would call the very same function that you see in line of code number one. So this is a recursive function. I will start the same process again with a new ray, a new starting point, and a new direction. And in the end, if I have traced a sufficient number of rays, then I will exit this recursion and I collect the result of this in this variable that's called reflected. And in the end, this is the elegant representation of the rendering equation, the emission, the LE, plus the integrated function, which is the BRDF times uh, this reflected, which is all the recursive terms. So this means that I shoot out this ray in the hemisphere, and there's going to be many subsequent bounces, and I add up all this energy into the reflected incoming light term. So this is the pseudo fold. This is not this is not something that you should try to compile or anything like that. But this is what we will code during the next lecture. This is just a schematic overview on what is happening exactly. It's actually very trivial. We shoot a ray, we bounce it on the scene, and then we hopefully hit the light source at some point. And even if we hit the light source, we continue. But hitting the light source is important, because this is where the emission term comes from. Let me show you what's, what's going on if, if we don't hit light sources. So this LE is the emission term on the left side here. So we add this to the end result at every recursion step. <coughs> And the fundamental question is that if we have a long light path that doesn't hit the light source, we are using completely random sampling, or maybe some smart important sampling. Well, then we never we will never have this emission term. What does this mean? That the radiance that we we give we, we get from the program is going to be zero. So the corollary of this is that only you will get radiance, you will get an output from only light paths that hit a light source. If you don't hit a light source, you don't know where the light is coming from, so you will return a black pixel. 
And this is obviously a really bad thing because you're computing, churning out samples and samples and samples perhaps on your GPU, but it doesn't return you anything. So it's, it's a very peculiar fact about simple naive path tracing is that if you have a small light source, the convergence of your, your final image is going to be slower. Why? Someone help me out. Smaller light sources, more variance, slower convergence. Because we need a random race to hit the light source. Mm -hmm. If it's smaller, then we won't hit it as often. Exactly. Exactly. So the relative probability of hitting the light source is going to be less for a small light source. And up to the extreme, where we have a point light source, and if we have a point light source, then we will see that we will be in trouble. Because what I would expect from my path tracer is to return something like this. Well, imagine a point light source in here. But this is not what we will end up with. So I would expect it to return the correct result. Many people have reported many forums on the internet that, hey, I implemented it, but this is what I got. And wow, this, this doesn't work at all. On, I mean, all these Fresnel's law, Snell's law, total internal reflection, Monte Carlo integration. For a black image, I mean, I could generate this with five lines of C++. <laughs> why, why do we even bother? We will get nothing. Why is that? Point light source, black image. Why? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So a point represents a location in mathematics. It does not have area. So technically, it is the same. Hitting a point by source is impossible because this is the same as what you study in statistics and probability theory. That if you have one number in a continuous scale, what is the probability of hitting this number? Zero, because that's a point. It has no surface area. It's infinitely small. You cannot hit it. So this is the reason of your black image. If you read the forms on the internet, you will find plenty of this. Now, we could also sum up our findings, internet meme style, if you will. So if you would like to compute path tracing with a point light source, Without the technique that is called next event estimation, then you usually will expect a wonderful image. But this is what you will get in reality. Now, the first question is obviously how will we overcome this? What we can do is that every time we hit something, some object in the scene, be it if used for anything but not light sources, we compute the direct effect of the light source on this point. So this is a schematic to show what is going on. So I start from the viewer, I hit this sphere, and I don't just start tracing the new ray outwards, but I will connect this point to the light source, and I will compute a direct illumination term. This is the schematic for path tracing without the next event estimation, and this is with next event estimation. So at every station, I connect to the light source, in this case, this is actually occluded. In this case, this is debatable. And in the third bounds, you will get some contributions from the light source. Question is, how do we do this exactly? Well, this is the topic. This was the topic of assignment zero. So the formula that you see in assignment zero is exactly the very same thing as what you should be using. What was in there? Well, what we were interested in is that there was a term with, with the 4 pi, because if you have a light source that's a sphere, then what you would, then, then we are interested in how much radiance is emitted in one direction. So then you would need to divide by the area of the surface, which is a division by 4 pi, and there's going to be the attenuation term, which is r squared. Same as in the gravitational law or in the law of electric fields. It means that the further away I am from the light source, the less light is going to be. And this is a really good technique because of 
multiple reasons. And one of the reasons is that you will get contributions from every bounce during the computing the life path. Before I proceed, I would like to tell you that here, this L, we are talking about this LE, the emission term. And we are adding these parts of this emission term in every bounce. So if I hit P1, I add this something. If I hit P2, I add this something. If I hit P3, then I also add this something. But when I hit the light source, I don't add the emission term anymore because I will be adding it again. So this one LB that you would add when you hit the light source by chance, this is distributed into individual boxes. Why is this great? One, you can render point light sources because the direct effect you can actually measure, but you cannot hit the light source itself. So that's great. Two, you will have less variance because it's not like I either hit the light source or I don't. I statistically always will hit the light source unless there are occluders. So I'm adding many samples with small variances, not one sample and lottery because you either win or you don't get anything back. So I can lower the variance, which means that my images will converge faster. And the other thing is that because there are contributions of every bounce, I can separate direct and indirect illumination. So a lot of people do this in the industry because the movie industry is nowadays using path tracing. I cannot say that like that as an all-encompassing something statement. But for instance, Disney is now using global illumination and in, in that mostly path tracing. Why? Because it looks insanely good and it is very simple. And it took them more than 20 years for them to replace their old system which they really liked, it was called Grace. And now they are using global illumination path tracing. It has taken a long time, but the benefits of global illumination are now too big to pass on. And what they are doing is that they get a physically based result, but this is not always what the artists are looking for. Because if you have worked together with artists, then they will say, okay, you have computed a beautiful image, but I would like the shadows to get a bit brighter. You, 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 as the engineer, say that, well, this is not possible. I computed what would happen in physical reality, and that's it. But the artists are not interested in physical reality. They are interested in their own thoughts and their own artistic vision. And they would like to change the shadows. So you could technically uh, make one of the light sources brighter, and then the shadows would get brighter. But then the artist says, hey, but don't change anything else in the scene. Just change the shadows. And then you could pull out your knowledge of the rendering equation that look, the radiance coming out from this point depends on its surroundings. So you cannot just make something brighter and the nearby things will also get brighter. You, you cannot circumvent that. Well, you can. What you can do with the next event estimation is that you take, you generate an image from the first bounce. So you will get one image which is, which you deposit the radiance that you measured in P1. That's an image. And then you create another image which will only contain the second bounces, P2, and upwards. So you would have multiple images, and you could technically just add up all of these images with simple addition, and you would get physical reality. Great. But if the artist says that I want stronger indirect illumination, then you would grab this buffer, this image, that holds up the second and the higher order bounces, and you could do some Photoshop or you could do whatever you want with that without touching anything else. So you have a nice separation for direct and indirect illumination. Movie industry, sorry, the movie industry, they love it. They are playing with it all the time. And in the in later you will see some algorithms that behave differently on indirect illumination and differently on direct illumination. You can only do that if you separate these terms. So let's see path tracing now with next event estimation. I have the very first bounce, and before I continue my way, I will send the sh classical, super, super classical shadow ray to the light source, a uh, randomly chosen point of the light source, and I will add this direct contribution of the light source to this point. And then I continue. 
let's go back to the terms, sorry. We use many terms for the very same thing. This is why I'm writing all of these terms, because if you read the forums, if you read papers, you will see these terms and they all mean the same. So explicit like something, max demand estimation, the very same thing. So I continue my ray, and I also hit the light source with the shadow ray, and then I continue on and on and on. And imagine that this third one is an outgoing ray that actually hits the light source. And if I do, I don't add the LP curve in there, because I did in the previous boxes. It's very important to know. Now, you have seen the results for a point light source. Nothing versus something, that's pretty hefty. But even if you have a reasonably big light source, like a light light side light source, I told you that you can have a variance suppression effect as well. So this is some amount of samples per pixel. I think it's two, maybe three samples per pixel. So this means that I grab one pixel and I send three rays to it. So it's three Monte Carlo samples. Now, this you can do in two different ways, because if you start to use renderers, then you will see how this exactly happens. Some renderers are rendering tiles. So what they do is that they start with some pixels, and if you say, I want 1,000 samples per pixel, then it will start, take one or four, or whatever number of threads you have on your machine. It will take four, sample, four pixels, and it will shoot more and more samples through it. And after it got to 1,000 samples, it will stop and show you a really good and converged pixel. And what we call progressive rendering is the opposite. You pick one pixel, you shoot a ray through it, but only one. And then you go to the next. And then you go to the next. And then you will see an image that has some amount of noise, and progressively you will get less and less noise. So this is what you see here is progressive render in motion. Now, no next event estimation, so we only get contributions if we hit this light source in here somewhere. If we don't, we will get a black sample. Now, look closely, this is with next event estimation. So there's a huge difference. Such a simple technique can speed up the rendering of many scenes with orders of magnitude. You can also play with this program. By the way, this is implemented on Shader Toy. So when you read this at home, just click on the link and play with it. It's amazingly fun. 